Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. O'Hagan. I'm one of the pediatric pulmonologists here. I'm actually med peds trained, so I have a little bit of internal medicine background. Um, what I was asked to talk about today was hereditable lung disease. But in the interest of time, we decided to just talk about cystic fibrosis. That is definitely a full hour lecture. Um, in fact, it's probably going to be going too fast. So hopefully uh, we'll get it done in the next uh, 40 minutes for you guys so you don't get, get out of here too late. My objectives today are to review the genetics, the diagnosis, the different phenotypes of cystic fibrosis, and to describe why it's important for you guys to know a little bit about it, not only for your boards, but for your, for your futures and whatever specialty you're, you're in. So CF remains the most common autosomal recessive life-shortening disease in Caucasians, with more than 30,000 people uh, affected with it in the United States. The, uh, the gene for it was discovered almost 25 years ago now, and it's called CFTR, or Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator. When the gene was first discovered, they found one mutation, which is the Delta F508, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But as of today, there's over 1,500 mutations, which makes the interpretation difficult because some of them probably don't have much functional relevance. Again, this is just to remind us that it's autosomal recessive. Obviously, both parents need to be carriers. And uh, when they have children, there's a one in four chance that an affected child will have cystic fibrosis. The boards, at least in peds, like to trick you with a question saying that you have a 30-year-old woman who is healthy, who um, has a brother with cystic fibrosis, um, and her um, what's, what's the chance that she is a carrier? And the trick is, because she does not have cystic fibrosis, it's going to be two in three not one and two. So have you guys seen that in question before? Yeah. Um, again, cystic fibrosis uh, depends on your ethnicity. It's more common in uh, whites, particularly those from uh, uh, Northern Europe. The, the thought behind that was that being a carrier for cystic fibrosis uh, protected you against cholera-induced watery diarrhea. So there was a survival advantage back in the 1800s. But again, it's found in all populations. So any CF center, there will be African Americans and there will be Hispanics. So the age of diagnosis. Again, if you take a look at the um, number of patients on the y-axis and their, their age on the x-axis, it remains predominantly a pediatric disease at time of diagnosis, with more than 80% of patients diagnosed by five years of age. And this um, is actually going to shift towards the left with the advent of newborn screening, which was uh, mandated to start last year by the United States government. So now every state is doing newborn screening. That said, there are still some patients that you're going to see in your adult practice that you're going to diagnose with cystic fibrosis because they're going to be missed by newborn screening, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. When we look at the age distribution, again, it is skewed to the left uh, towards the pediatric population with the mean age now about 17 years. But again, there are some patients over the age of 70, and I personally have taken care of some grandmothers with CF, so you are going to see them. And what we've been noticing over the years is that more and more patients are uh, becoming adults. So the, the difference between the, the, the pediatric and the adult group is getting smaller and smaller and smaller every year. And the current, uh, with the current trend, the estimate is that adults will surpass, surpass pediatric patients with CF in, over the next five years. Obviously, the main reason for that is improving survival. We take a look at by, by year and the median survival. We're now at about 38 years of survival, which is much better than it was uh, when the gene was discovered when it was less than 28. And if we actually take a look by birth cohort, um, that difference is improving over time. So, you know, obviously this is the uh, 85 to 89 all the way to um, the first five years of the, uh, the 20th century, 21st century. Um, that difference is getting bigger and bigger and bigger at every age group. And what is also encouraging is the thought that maybe the slope is also becoming flatter over time. So the hope is that patients are going to live even longer. One of the reasons that for this is newborn screening, uh, obviously better care in the pediatric age group, but what we're going to find over the next 20 years is that you're going to be seeing more and more CF patients making it to adulthood that are actually in great nutritional and lung function shape. Nutrition and lung function are very tightly correlated, so nutrition is a good surrogate for, for lung disease and cystic fibrosis. So if we take a look, um, this is data from Colorado, which was one of the states that started newborn screening back in the mid-80s. Patients that were diagnosed classically either by symptoms or something in pediatrics called meconium ileus, uh, 
and you take a look at what percentage of them were nutritional failure um, at, at varying age groups, and then compare them to patients that were diagnosed either prenatally uh, or by the newborn screen that was done in Colorado. And you can see that there's a statistically significant improvement in nutrition, which not only is present in the first year of life, which is when they're diagnosed, but it persists even to, to uh, their adolescent years. And this, uh, as would be expected, translates to improved lung function. Again, same sort of data, symptoms meconiomalias, um, and then prenatal and newborn screening. There's this uh, improvement in your FEV1 um, at all age groups, which persists. It's about a 9% difference, which doesn't sound like a ton, but the average CF patient will decline lung function by between 1% and 2% a year. So you're talking at, you know, 4 to 8 years uh, improvement in survival. So CF is transitioning into an adult disease, and the drive for CF care in pediatrics is to provide a high quality of, of life for as long as possible. And our goal is to minimize lung disease so by the time we transition them to the adult world, they're in good uh, shape. Again, it was cloned in 86. It's, um, um, CFTR has two hydropho hydrophobic regions, sorry, two hydrophobic regions which are transmembrane uh, spanning. There's a regulatory domain and then there's two ATP binding sites. The um, most common mutation is the Delta F508. Um, about two-thirds of patients will have that. Again, that's eth ethnically determined. So, for example, in African-Americans, it's about 50% of Delta F508, and in Hispanics, it's about 25%. But again, uh, across eth uh, ethnic groups, it remains the most common mutation. The second most common is this G542X, and as you can see, it's only 2.5%. So there are huge numbers of mutations that account for a very small number of CF patients, um, which makes it very difficult to make a diagnosis just by uh, genetic uh, screening. Uh, this is a representative sample of a cell. You know, obviously you have a protein which, which gets transcribed, processed, and makes it to this apical cell surface. And for CFTR, it, it uh, moves chloride uh, into the lumen. There are six different classes of mutations in cystic fibrosis. The first is complete absence of synthesis. The second is dysfunctional uh, packaging, which leads to premature degradation. The third class is dysfunctional regulation at the um, uh, regulatory protein. Uh, the fourth is impaired conductance. The fifth is uh, decreased uh, transcription, usually due to what are called splice uh, defects. And then finally, class 6 is accelerated turnover. As you can imagine, the class 1 and 2 mutations are going to have the greatest impact compared to these other mutations, which typically are milder mutations. And what you're going to hear about over the next 5 to 10 years are different types of medications that are going to be called either correctors or potentiators. The correctors are obviously working on the defect itself. Potentiators making the receptor that makes it to the cell surface work better. And in actual fact, the most common mutation in the Delta F508, if you can confuse the cell to allow it to go to the cell surface, it actually has some uh, activity, albeit not as good as a, as a normal uh, CFTR. So what you might see for the Delta F508 is the use of a corrector, which allows more of it to pass through, as well as a potentiator, which allows it to work better once it gets there. So the CF community is very excited about, uh, about those. When you took take a look at the genotype and phenotype in CF, um, obviously you need two mutations. In order to have severe disease, typically you need two severe mutations, so the Delta F508 with two severe mutations. Those are the patients that are going to be diagnosed in the pediatric world. You guys are going to see them as we transition them to adulthood. What you might see for the first time are those that have the milder mutations. They're diagnosed later, they're typically pancreatic sufficient, their sweats are a little more complicated, less uh, obvious. Um, the, the men may be fertile, and the lung function is variable. Again, nutrition and lung function are closely tied together. One uh, example that turns out to happen quite well, frequently in the adult world is this altered splicing uh, phenomenon. And there's a polythymidine tract uh, in CFTR gene. The fewer thymidines you get, the less splicing you get of transcripts of CFTR, so it's more dysfunctional, with 9 being normal and 5 being uh, markedly abnormal. And what they found was that in men that have congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, or CBAVD, which is um, the universal cause of uh, infertility in uh, classic cystic fibrosis, uh, 
was that men that did not have any other signs and symptoms consistent with CF had a higher than expected number of mutations in the CFTR. 18% actually had two CFTR mutations, with at least one being mild, and typically it was this R117H7T, and then 55% had at least one CFTR mutation, with another two-thirds having that 5T on the other allele. And again, they didn't have any lung or pancreatic disease when they were studied, and the long-term outcome of these patients remains unknown. So there's a lot of debate in the CF communities whether you consider this patient to have, these patients to have cystic fibrosis or not. So when we talk about making a diagnosis of CF, you need two main things. You need to have the appropriate uh, clinical situation. And in the adult world, what you might see is bronchiectasis. You might see some nasal polyps, particularly if they're not allergic. Um, certainly, you see mucoid pseudomonas, recurrent pancreatitis, obstructive azospermia, as in the previous cases, and uh, clubbing can certainly happen. In the peds, you tend to see the ones that are more in the white. The other um, features that would be uh, consistent would be a family history of cystic fibrosis, and this is a first-degree family member, and in pediatrics, we see positive newborn screening. And once you have those, one of those three things, you also need to have evidence of CFTR dysfunction. And that's one of two ways predominantly, either an elevated sweat chloride test, um, and you need to repeat on two separate occasions because there is a th false positive rate, or you need to have two CFTR mutations that are known to be CF causing. So for example, if you had two mutations of the Delta F508, that would be acceptable. In research studies, um, places they also do have a nasal potential difference, but I don't think you guys would be ordering that. So just briefly, sweat testing, uh, it remains the first diagnostic test when you look for cystic fibrosis, not genetics. It's too complicated. You don't know what test you're getting. You don't know if you need to do full sequencing or, or not. And then once you get the results, they're very hard to interpret. Again, greater than 60 uh, would be consistent with CF. Uh, 40 to 60 would be considered borderline, and less than 40 in, in adults would be considered to be normal. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that sweat electrolytes actually increase with age. What we've found out with newborn screening is that lower sweat tests in, in pediatrics can actually be consistent with CF. You can start at like 32, and then by the time they're in their teenager years, it's over 60. There are other causes of uh, elevated sweat tests. Uh, most of them are pretty obvious uh, clinically. The ones that you can get confused with, if there's some malnutrition, adrenal insufficiency, or hypothyroidism, so if you get a sweat test, it's abnormal, let's say 61, 62. It doesn't make sense as to why it would be abnormal. Think about those three possibilities and then repeat the sweat test once it's corrected. Again, DNA testing, there are lots of companies that are now doing it. It ranges from just checking for the DOTSAT 508 mutation to full sequencing. And then again, sequencing can reveal these novel mutations or even polymorphisms that we're not quite sure what to do with. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists does recommend offering screening to all patients. They do a 23 mutation panel, which gets 93% of all mutations. And then certainly you can do prenatal uh, diagnosis if, if the family desires it. So let's talk about the pulmonary stuff. Again, 90% of patients with cystic fibrosis die from a pulmonary death. The other 10% are from a liver cirrhosis death and FEV1 is the best predictor. So you'll see us talking a lot about what the patient's FEV1 is. There are some factors that will affect survival. If you're pancreatic sufficient, you tend to have better lung function. If you're a male, you tend to have better lung function and survival. If you have good infecting organisms, uh, Staph aureus, for example, um, and no pseudomonas, you're gonna have better survival. Obviously, your level of fitness, and then treatment. And it's been well studied now that patients that are followed in a CF center uh, have improved survival and lung function over time. So the recommendation uh, by the CF Foundation is that all patients are, are followed in a CF care center. The pathogenesis of lung disease, um, obviously you have the defective CF gene, defective CFTR, decreased chloride secretion, and then increased sodium absorption. And what this leads to is a vicious cycle of obstruction, infection, and inflammation. And it is a vicious cycle. Obviously, if you get infection, you get more inflammation. You get more inflammation, you make more mucus. You make more mucus, you get more obstructed, and the cycle just, just continues. So the ultimate end result is, is lung disruption. There are obviously other factors that go into it. You can have patients from the same family that have varying degrees of lung disruption. There's probably some environmental or modifier gene input uh, into the development of lung disease, which uh, there's a lot of interest being shown right now in looking at these modifier genes.
And this is sort of the classic pathology you'll see in a, in a CF lung, big mucus plug, neutrophilic inflammation. When we look at lung function, again, by birth cohort, uh, starting from the 80s, you'll, you'll continue to see this improvement in lung function over, over, over time at, at all age groups. The unfortunate thing that the CF community is trying to figure out is, if you notice, it's improving absolutely, but the slopes are not changing. And obviously, if you want to make a huge improvement in FEV1 and, and survival, is if you can flatten out this line, you're going to get more and more benefit. And so a lot of people are trying to figure out how we can, we can do that. Obviously, um, what we're currently doing is improving lung function, but it's not improving the slope. And uh, so there's lots of different therapeutic uh, choices here. There's a lot of hope in, in trying to actually do some gene therapy. When it was first discovered in, in, in the mid-'80s, the hope was that there would be gene therapy available in five years. It proved to be a much tougher task. The uh, truth is you can actually get a, a normal CFTR into the uh, pulmonary epithelium, uh, usually using an adenoviral vector. The problem is that it creates such a huge inflammatory host response that it just does not persist. You can get it to last there five days, you give it again, it lasts three days, you give it again, it lasts one day. So the key is going to be trying to come, come up with a way of um, stealthily getting into the, into the epithelium. The um, next uh, work would be to work on the actual protein itself, and again, that's some of the uh, correctors that we talked about, and that's the one that you're going to see, be seeing probably in the New England Journal over the next year uh, with some trials on BX8809. Um, you can work on the actual uh, ion transport, uh, which would be the correctors. Um, BX770 is obviously from the same company, and that work, that's how that works. There is one new therapy out um, over the last two years called hypertonic saline, which I'm sure you guys are seeing uh, being used in the CF patients. Finally, well, not finally, you can work on the infection inflammation route. Um, macrolides are used and new, other new medications, something called Casten, and there's some other things that are in the pipeline. And obviously, finally, if you work on the, the end-stage disease, which is with transplant. So the hope is that we can shift from this paradigm to this paradigm over time, which should hopefully change the slope of decreased lung function. Changing to the types of infections you get in CF, uh, Staph aureus uh, is the most common infection, particularly in the young age group. As in most areas of medicine, we're seeing more and more MRSA. Um, Pseudomonas is the uh, next, if it'll move, is the, is the next um, organism. And around teenagehood, uh, Pseudomonas takes over as being the most common uh, organism found in, in CF patients. So if you're asking your boards what's the appropriate therapy to start, and it's an adult, make sure you're covering for pseudomonas and not just for staph. That's the opposite if you're asked on your peds boards. There's also a variety of other organisms that you, you may have seen. Haemophilus is more common in kids. Um, Burkhold erysipatia is, is a bad player. Uh, Central famosa multophilia is an unknown player as to how uh, impactful it is on overall lung function, uh, to name a few. Just briefly with staph, um, because it serves as a good paradigm for, for most infections in CF, once you're infected, there are three outcomes. You can either eradicate the organism, you can eradicate it but get reinfected by another strain, or you go into the cycle of exacerbation treatment and remission. And by the time patients with um, typical CF or two severe mutation CF, this is predominantly where, where they're at. If you're diagnosing someone for the first time, you might be in those first two categories. The thought also with staph is that it um, causes lung damage, which then promotes pseudomonas colonization. And the reason for that is we'll often see staph go away once you get pseudomonas uh, in the airway. Obviously, resistance is a problem, 15% are uh, MRSA. The challenge for a lot of uh, pulmonary docs is to decide when to treat for staph. Obviously, you don't want to over-treat staph. You're, then you're going to get into even a larger resistance issue. So what everybody will agree on is if it's the only isolated organism, if they are really sick, like they're having hemoptysis or on the ventilator, if the gram stain suggests significant burden, you know, 3, 4 plus on the gram stain, and if they're not improving with standard therapies and when you're not treating for staph. Um, other people will blanketly treat staph whenever the patient's admitted to the hospital. I don't know what the practice is here, to be honest. Um, but in general, NCF, if you isolate an organism, you don't necessarily have to treat it. 
because oftentimes they're just colonizing and it's not causing significant clinical burden. Uh, Pseudomonas, again, uh, is uniquely orientated for the CF uh, lung. It starts out with this non-mucoid phenotype, which then uh, progresses into a mucoid phenotype. And the difference is it develops what's called an alginate gel layer. So instead of growing in like little planktonic um, bacteria, it actually grows in these super colonies where you have huge fronds of Pseudomonas sort of stuck in the, super stru the structure of the alginate layer. And as you can imagine, it's very hard for antibiotics to, to get into that, uh, uh, into that, get, to get through that gel layer to actually get to the organism itself. What is interesting in CF is that even if someone is um, resistant to, an, organ, to uh, an antibiotic, even just treating them with an antibiotic can actually decrease the load. The thought is that it's probably related to the virulence factors. This is particularly true for the fluoroquinolones. Um, again, on boards, they'll ask uh, how to treat someone. We rarely use single agents for pseudomonas. We typically double cover, uh, which decreases resistance. Uh, typically, we like using immunoglycoside and beta-lactam. We try to stay away from the fluoroquinolones, not because they're bad, but because you want to save them for outpatient oral therapy. Um, there is chronic suppressive therapies that people have used with uh, Toby or now casein being the most common. Some people will use uh, uh, intermittent ciprofloxacin. And uh, in some places of the world, they actually use courses of uh, intravenous antibiotics as chronic suppressive therapy. Uh, the vaccines uh, are still under study. The first uh, go-around was very unsuccessful. Cepatia is a bad player. There's uh, 13 G uh, genoma virus, which are sort of different uh, categories of cepatia. We used to think that it was just one, but it's actually a complex now. The Cepatia syndrome, which is where it became uh, known to us with uh, people dying within a month of uh, uh, culturing cepatia in Toronto actually had something called genovavar type 3, which is senocepatia. Um, a lot of patients will have a faster decline than otherwise would be expected. Remember the 1 to 2 percent on average per year, they'll be 3 to 5 percent. And then there are some uh, members of the complex that actually do not appear to have any uh, impact on, on decline in lung function. So it's important to know which cepatia you're talking about, and that often needs to be uh, a send out to a special lab in, in Michigan. We have learned that cohorting patients is important in CF. Um, you should see your patients being in uh, isolation when they're in the hospital. We try to keep them away from one another when they're in the outpatient world. Uh, back in the early 90s, they asked, used to have these CF camps, uh, which is where the cepatia syndrome sort of came about. Uh, that's no longer uh, happening. Um, and again, the cepatia organisms are very resistant. When we talk about standard therapy for CF, um, we want to uh, get rid of the secretions. Uh, there's a whole variety of ways of doing it. Bottom line is that whatever someone's willing to do is what's going to work the best. So that's what you should do. Um, exercise is something that we are playing a, uh, uh, paying more attention to in CF. Um, and not only is it good for, for the musculature, but it's also good for, for mucus clearance. So exercise is, is very important. Bronchodilators are used routinely probably because pulmonologists feel very comfortable using bronchodilators. The truth is um, it's hard to know who's going to be uh, uh, helped by bronchodilators in CF because a lot of the uh, obstruction is fixed and not dynamic. Um, some patients with CF will have some asthma symptoms, so it might be helpful in those. And then there is some information that perhaps um, albuterol helps with improving mucociliary beat frequency, so it actually clears the secretions better um, as well. Hypertonic ceiling is, is a new, newer uh, therapy that's now in vogue. Um, it actually came from, uh, from Australia where they noticed that surfers uh, with CF actually had better lung function than pe people that lived on the interior of Australia. Um, and then they ended up doing a study of 7% um, hypertonic ceiling and found out that actually improved lung function by 6 to 12%. Um, downside is it's pretty bronchoreactive, so patients can have a lot of coughing and chest pain associated with it. Nobody's really quite sure how it works. It certainly makes you cough, so the thought is maybe it helps improve mucus secretion. There, there is some um, work being done with bacterial obstinins, op so it actually makes your any um, immune response work better against pseudomonas. That's not a possibility because it requires uh, uh, salt in order to work effectively. The most likely reason, though, is that you're increasing airway surface liquid hydration, which is the, the issue in CF. Uh, 
eucalyptics have been used. Um, N-acetylcysteine or mucamist uh, was used in, in the past. Do you guys use it here? Okay. Um, we, we don't like using NCF. Um, it actually causes a lot of airway inflammation and actually impairs ciliary function. So it's actually a pro-inflammatory agent in, in the lung, um, which in CF we don't like. What most people are using now is pulmazyme. Definitely improves FEV1, fewer exacerbations, and it's now improved all the way down to years of age. It is expensive, two to four thousand dollars a month on, on average, um, once a day therapy. Anti-inflammatory therapy. We, we talked about inflammation being a, a, a being a part of CF. If you actually do bronchoscopies in babies that are diagnosed through newborn screening, you'll have a ton of neutrophils in the lower airway, even without organisms. So the thought is that the neutrophilic inflammation is actually the, the first step in developing CF lung disease. There have been studies looking at um, every other day prednisone in CF, um, definitely improved lung function, but the hyperglycemia and um, growth retardation was a problem, so we no longer use that routinely. Uh, High-dose ibuprofen is used in uh, Cleveland with nearly every patient with mild CF lung disease, and they've actually shown that there's significant improvement in FEV1. Um, other centers have not uh, gotten on the bandwagon for a variety of reasons. One is it requires um, blood monitoring for ibuprofen, which is a 24-hour admission, um, and then there have been some side effects with uh, GI bleeding required transfusion and transient uh, real insufficiency. So it's not used routinely, but it is uh, one of the options. Inhaled uh, glucocorticoids, again, we're pulmonologists. We like using inhaled steroids. There actually are no CF studies that have shown whether glucocorticoids work in CF. There's been one a dose down trication study which showed that decreasing the dose of uh, fluticasone did not lead to worsening lung function. So there, there are currently some studies um, that are looking at placebo um, versus fluticasone. And finally, azithromycin is used not for its antimicrobial effect, we think, um, because pseudomonas in routine culture is not affected by azithromax. What Zithromax tends to do is, um, is break down that alginate gel layer so the other antibiotics can get in there better and kill the pseudomonas. Um, and three times a week, Zithromax has been shown to improve lung function in, in CF in, in a variety of studies now as well. So that's pretty standard therapy for pseudomonas. Um, and finally, of course, antibiotics are cornerstone. Um, you can give them orally, inhaled, IV. Um, there are sort of two situations. One is for the exacerbation with an acute worsening of lung disease, and the other is to try to prevent this decline in lung function, which is considered maintenance therapy. For maintenance therapy, obviously, decreased bacteria, decreased toxins, decreased lung damage. Uh, oral therapies for staph um, are shown here. They were in vogue probably about 15, 20 years ago, um, are still in vogue in some centers. But for the most part, people are not using it because you, you tend to get earlier pseudomonas, which we think is a worse player than staph. Um, some centers will do ciprofloxin on an every three month basis for those that are, have chronic pseudomonas, and that's certainly an option. Downside is you get more resistance. And finally, in Europe, particularly Denmark, they actually routinely have their patients come in every three months for three weeks and do an IV clean out. I don't know if uh, healthcare would pay for that here. Um, Inhaled is the route that most of us go. It's something you can do at home. Uh, Toby has been uh, out for 11 years now. Uh, Kasten came out this year, which is an inhaled as Trinam. Both of them are used for these 28-day cycles. You're on for 28 days, you're off for 28 days. They've both been shown to improve lung function, decrease exacerbations, decrease the density of pseudomonas. Um, for both, there is an increase in the MIC of pseudomonas. The caveat, though, is when you measure the MICs, you're actually measuring what you would get in the blood, right? So when you give IV tobramycin, you can't go above a certain value, otherwise you're going to get renal failure and ototoxicity. The truth is when you inhale it, it's not getting systemically absorbed. So when you give inhaled TOBI, for example, the concentration in your lung is, is about 1,000, as opposed to you know the 12 to 14 you might want to push in, in the serum. So you totally overwhelm the resistance pattern of the pseudomonas. So what we'll, what we'll notice is even if your MIC is high and we would say you're resistant to tobramycin, the clinical benefit is as good as if you had no resistance to tobramycin. And we presume the same is going to be true for as and am uh, Clistin is another um, inhaled antibiotic that, that we'll use. It's probably now third in, in line after tobramycin and, and casein. Um, main reasons for that is it's pretty bronchoreactive and it smells terrible. The good news is most CF patients have pretty severe um, sinus disease, so most of them don't 
they're anosmic, so they can't smell it. Um, if they're in a relationship, though, then they have to go to the other room. So, so one of the uh, challenges for CF is trying to decide whether someone's having an exacerbation. And despite people doing CF for, I don't know, 50 years now, no one, will, no one can uh, agree on what a pulmonary exacerbation truly is. And they'll use all of these varying criteria and sort of gestalt it and say, yes, this person is having a pulmonary exacerbation. Um, so you might see some patients that are admitted to the hospital with an exacerbation, which all they have is decreasing weight um, and maybe lung function has dropped 10%. Don't make the mistake of telling someone with CF in the hospital, you look so good. Um, they really hate that. So, All right, but once you get your data, you're going to decide, are they mild, are they severe? If they're mild, you might try some oral or inhaled therapies. If they're severe, obviously you need to bring them in for IVs. You're going to reevaluate them. Hopefully they get back to baseline, and then you can reevaluate uh, their maintenance therapy and attempt to try to avoid a future uh, hospitalization. Certainly if they don't return to baseline, uh, you have to figure out why that is. And if they were treated with oral therapy, you're likely going to admit them at that point for, for IV therapy. Some of the reasons, um, if you're on the wrong antibiotic, that could be a good reason. Um, inadequate dose. CF patients have a, a large volume of distribution, so they need much higher doses than, than non-CF patients. Um, maybe they have a new, a new CF complication. Um, pneumothorax, uh, allergic bronchopulmonary mycosis, uh, maybe they're in uh, heart failure. They could certainly have a secondary pul pulmonary problem. Um, maybe they're not doing good airway clearance at home or in the hospital. And then certainly if they're not doing their stuff at home, that could be an issue. And finally, the, the dreaded that maximum improvement has been achieved, and that certainly happens with, with exacerbations. Um, just briefly on complications, uh, respiratory failure. Again, lung function, lung disease is 90% of uh, causes of death. It can be hypoxic or hypercapnic. Um, typically, they're, treat, they're um, pre precipitated by readily treated complications, Tip, typically an, uh, an infectious complication. Uh, hypoxia is treated in a standard way with the standard criteria for supplemental oxygen. Um, hypercaptic is a little more complicated. Um, again, you're going to treat the acute complications that should be there. What most of us will do is use um, assisted mechanical ventilation if they have an acute reversible event, pneumothorax, bad bronchospasm, central mucus plugging, or if they weren't on optimal therapies at home. The thought being that if you institute or correct those issues, their lung function is going to improve and they'll be able to get off the ventilator. Um, many of us will um, intubate a patient if they're already on a lung transplant list and they have a hope of, of getting a lung transplant fairly, fairly soon. Where we tend not to intubate is if they're having progressive respiratory failure that's unresponsive to intensive standard therapy and there's no hope for transplant. Um, we'll often use BiPAP as a, as, a, as a bridge to either transplant if they have uh, chronic hypercapnic failure or not. Um, this is obviously a, a challenging area and needs to have discussions before you're in the midst of trying to make that decision for, for the family and the patient. Pneumothorax, uh, pretty common, 20% of the time. They all need to be admitted. If it's more than 20% or they're symptomatic, you need to do a, 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 put a tube in. Um, certainly if it's recurrent or persistent, you can do pleurodesis. In, in the past, um, there was a contraindication to transplant. That is no longer the case. Uh, anymore because they're because doing VATS therapy now for that. So that's good. Mopsis is common, uh, particularly with an exacerbation. Massive is a little less common, thankfully, about 1% per patient year, um, and it's uh, pretty high mortality. Um, for all cases, you're going to try to define the, the site of bleeding. You want to rule out coagulopathy. Remember, patients with uh, cystic fibrosis have a can have a vitamin K deficiency, so you want to correct that. And obviously, stop all medications associated with bleeding, like NSAIDs. Treat the infection. Some places will use cough suppressants. You actually end up stopping their inhaled therapies because they can be bronchoreactive and cause some irritation. You hold off on CPT because you want the plug, the, the clot to form. You don't want it to be dislodged. Uh, hold off on exercise and cross your fingers and hope. If, if that doesn't work or if it's bad, then the, the next step is uh, angiography and bronchial artery embolization. It is effective. It often needs to be repeated. We've had patients that have been uh, embolized 13 times. Um, complications are rare, but if they do occur, they are pretty significant. So um, being patient is what you try to do as best you can, but it is scary. <laughs> All right, we have 15 minutes. This is going to go quick. Science disease, problem in CF, probably the most common 
uh, reason why a CF patient will come in. It's if you do a sinus CT scan on a CF patient, they're going to have sinus disease. The, the, the symptoms are standard to other patients. Uh, patients with CF often will not complain about sinus uh, disease because they live with it every day. So um, that can be the challenge. When to treat is based on the impact and quality of life or if you're thinking about doing a lung transplant. Um, if you can clear their sinuses before lung transplant, they actually have better survival post-lung transplant. Treatment is complicated. You can try medical therapy, um, antibiotics, pretty good concordance between sinus uh, puncture and respiratory secretions. So you can go with whatever culture uh, you have available. You need to treat for a long time. Um, some people use actually uh, inhaled nasal antibiotics with a little what's called a sinus nebulizer or sinuneb. Um, you can try steroids. They tend to work better if you have nasal polyps. Seal and irrigation works. You can try some afrin, decongestants, inhibitions. As you can see, there's a potpourri of things that you can try. The truth is none of them work very well. Uh, and most patients, it's probably actually higher than that, end up undergoing, undergoing surgery. Osteoporosis is becoming more and more of an issue in our CF patients for a variety of reasons, which we won't go into. But at any age, um, CF patients have worse uh, bone health measured by DEXA scan than patients with non-CF. And obviously, the more severe your CF lung disease, the more severe the osteopenia. And treatment is pretty standard for what you guys are, are comfortable with. The only exception being that we might use some androgen, androgenic therapy in, in CF because they might have some sex hormone deficiencies. Diabetes is an hour-long discussion. Um, so if you want to discuss diabetes for an hour, um, actually today Endocrine Grand Rounds is on CF diabetes, which you can certainly go to. Um, again, it's, it's not like type 1, it's not type 2, it's probably an overlap of, of both. Um, it increases with the age up to 30%. Now we'll actually get over, over the age of 25. We do yearly glucose tolerance tests and hemoglobin A1Cs at age 10 or above. And just briefly, this is how it's a little different. Um, you tend not to get DKA in, in CF because they do have some residual insulin secretion. Um, again, um, they don't respond as well as type 2 to um, oral agents. Um, and long-term complications are possible. And the reason why they're possible is if patients live long enough, they're going to get the complications. So we're starting to see more and more um, complications from CF uh, DM. Uh, pancreatic disease, 85% um, have pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, again, two severe mutations lead to pancreatic insufficiency. Patients that are pancreatic sufficient don't have normal pancreatic function, even though they gain weight adequately. Uh, We'll skip PI because that's going to be something that happens in kids with the caveat that they do have fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, so you always want to make sure you're replacing your, your vitamins. And pancreatic sufficiency are the ones that you're going to see in your uh, clinic for the first time. And again, they're diagnosed later. They're milder symptoms, lower sweats, better lung function. They have fewer GI manifestations. But the key thing to remember is that 10% actually get recurrent pancreatitis. So if you see a patient in the hospital who's having recurrent pancreatitis, don't just blame alcohol. Think about CF as a possible as a possible etiology. The uh, pancreatic function testing for pancreatic insufficiency is something called a fecal elastase. It's uh, done on a single specimen. Doesn't matter whether you're on uh, supplemental enzymes or not. So it's actually a very good uh, test, which thankfully has replaced those terrible fecal fat collections that we used to do. Um, again, you use uh, pancreatic replacement therapy to control these steatitis symptoms, make sure they're getting nutrition. Uh, it needs to be individualized in terms of the dosing, replace the vitamins. Acid suppression actually works well with CF. And then you want to use supplements. Uh, I'm ignoring nutrition, which is probably the second most important um, feature of any CF talk, but we're going to ignore it. Um, we don't ignore it in the clinic. Uh, liver disease. Often it's due to hyperinflation, but don't ignore uh, liver disease in CF. So you need to rule out intrinsic liver disease before saying, oh, it's just hyperinflation. Um, the treatment for CF liver disease is Actigol, improves uh, hepatic bile flow. Uh, we're not quite sure whether being on Actigol for elevated transaminases decreases your risk of getting cirrhosis down, down the road. Once they do get cirrhosis, um, pretty standard to other types of cirrhosis, with the caveat that you want to try to avoid beta blockade, uh, if at all possible, due to concerns of bronchoconstriction. Gallbladder, um, if you do ultrasounds on CF patients, about 30% will have gallbladder abnormalities. 
So make sure that if you think they have cholecystitis and you see gallstones, don't just say it's cholecystitis. You need to prove it to yourself because they often will have asymptomatic uh, gallstones in CF. CF patients are more likely to get uh, strictures, gross and cholangitis, that's a, new, a neonatal issue, and fatty liver, probably for a variety of reasons, most likely being uh, CF-related diabetes that's not been diagnosed. Um, all the rest of these are things that are more common in CF patients compared to non-CF patients. They're more likely to have reflux, esophagitis, PUD, gastritis, and not acute appendicitis. For whatever reason, patients with CF have fewer uh, acute appendicitis, probably because they're on antibiotics. But what is important is they have a higher risk of complication, either abscess and perforation or mucoceles. So the thought is that you know, the symptoms are masked by other antibiotics, or people see a CF patient, they see they have some pain in the right lower quadrant, and they see it's related to something else. They don't put appendicitis on the list. So don't fall into that trap when you see a CF patient in the hospital complaining of right lower quadrant pain. Um, these are small intestine things that are more common. We'll touch on DOS and intussusception because you might see them uh, when you're managing CF patients in the hospital. Uh, intussusception, as the MedPeach people tell you, it's a disease of the young. Um, in CF patients, it's a disease of the old. Um, there's often a uh, intussusated secretions that act as a lead point. And in CF, they tend to be ileocolic, or they, but they can be ileal. The difference in interception for CF compared to pediatric population is hemochesia is rare in CF. So you don't get that red current jelly um, stool. They get uh, colic abdominal pain, often with a mat mass. You can do an ultrasound or you can do a contrast enema. Um, nice thing about a contrast enema is it also gives you hydrostatic reduction if there is a interception. And DOS, or distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, uh, is very common in CF. It's probably been unrecognized for, for a long time, 36% um, uh, probably over, over time uh, for patients. More likely if they're pancreatic insufficient, and more likely if they're not adhering to their enzymes or, or are dehydrated. You always want to think about it if they have this colonic abdominal pain and a mass in the right lower quadrant. Again, you want to make sure that you're not missing an append appendiceal abscess. Um, usually a pain radiograph will show uh, a fecal mass in that area. If they're not obstructed, you can just try oral um, therapy, typically with Um And if they are obstructed, then you might need to put in NG tubes and IV fluids and admit them, and you might need to go to a, a, a water contrast enema or gastrograph and enema. Um, carcinoma is more common in CF. Uh, IBDs, particularly Crohn's, is more common in CF. So when you have a CF patient with uh, abdominal pain, think about esophagitis, PUD, or pancreatitis, if they're pancreatic sufficient. If it's sort of right upper quadrant, think about these issues. If it's in the loin, think about kidney stones. They are more common in CF um, as well. If you have lower abdominal pain with or without a mask, you want to think about DOS and start out at least with a plain radiograph. If that shows changes that are consistent with DOS, then you can do conservative management, go lightly, uh, and contrast enema if the go lightly is not working. Um, however, if they're guarding and having rebound tenderness, which you should not see in DOS, you need to think about appendiceal disease and proceed with an ultrasound or CT and, and maybe even exploratory laparoscopy as well. We have five minutes. Uh, sexual function. Um, Many people would think that's actually impaired in CF. There's been lots of studies now that show that CF patients actually have a normal sex life, um, despite fatiguing easily, not increasing mental ventilation very great, um, you know, the stress of a chronic disease, uh, coughing during sex, uh, decreased libido, and this overall sense of unattractiveness due to their, um, their body habitus. Again, with pregnancy, an issue with uh, male infertility, but females with CF are fertile. Um, pregnancy is not uncommon. There was a thought for a long period of time that they were less fertile due to a thickened uh, cervical mucus. Those sperm are pretty persistent buggers, so that's not an issue. Um, there is a delay in sexual maturity of about two years uh, in CF females, and they do have more anovulatory cycles. Um, the outcomes are actually pretty good. Um, if you take away patients that have core pulmonary, are on oxygen or hypercarbic, their survival is as good as CF patients of, of the same ilk that are not pregnant. Uh, no increase in spontaneous abortions, but they are more likely to have a premature infant um, as well. 
the issue that you need to remember is if they're going to breastfeed, they're going to be losing a lot of calories in the average days. So they need to supplement. And then breast milk is normal in, in CF. Um, pregnancy, obviously, is never an easy decision. Um, you, you can do um, very complicated, very expensive ways of, if you have two CF carrier parents, you can, um, you can fertilize the egg. The egg can then be uh, analyzed to see if it has one or two copies of uh, the CF mutations, and if it doesn't, that one gets implanted. Um, but that obviously gets very expensive. Just real touching up very briefly, chronic pain is a major issue in CF. We tend to think that they're drug, drug seeking, but the truth is there are a wide variety of pain syndromes that they can have. Uh, one of the more common ones is uh, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, which can happen in any, any type of chronic lung disease, particularly in infectious lung disease. Um, it's chronic symmetrical bone pain. It often gets worse during a pulmonary exacerbation, and treatment is to treat the exacerbation, anti-inflammatories. Transplant is great, great treatment for it as well. In comparison to uh, episodic arthropathy, which tends to be more self-limiting, it's uh, asymmetric. They often will have a fever, and again, it's no correlation with lung disease, so it's not related to a CF exacerbation. And treatment for these are, are just symptomatic with NSAIDs or steroids. CF is also associated with, with the following, uh, particularly uh, ciprofloxacin causes drug-induced arthritis. And some CF patients will actually get vasculitis. Um, typical to other forms of vasculitis, painless purpura, typical of the lower extremities, um, again, not associated with pulmonary exacerbations. Skin biopsy shows leukocytoclastic vasculitis, and treatment is typically with steroids. Chronic metabolic al alkalosis, this is more of a uh, pediatric issue. Uh, obviously, you're losing a lot of sodium chloride from your, from your sweat in CF um, if you're sodium chloride deficient. Uh, you're going to have hyponatremia, hypochloremia, and you're going to have metabolic alkalosis. You can present with anorexia, bombing, and some kids will like to present with seizures. Um, so that's something to think about in, in hot climates. So in conclusion, CF is transitioning to an adult disease. Patients that you are going to be seeing in your clinics are going to have better lung function, better nutrition, and ultimately better survival. So they're going to, they're going to be with you for, for a long time. And what we're uh, finding out is that there are new complications to the CF community, but old complications to the adult community. Um, where, where I was before, we had our first patient that actually had a heart attack that had CF, and people thought it was just related to a CF lung disease. So we're starting to see sort of more typical uh, adult complications. There are new uh, therapies on the horizon which are exciting, but again, it won't reverse any damage that's already done, so it's, it behooves us to, to be aggressive in our management today. And certainly this has been a very quick go-through of CF, so if you want to learn more, feel free to join us in CF Clinic.